talking a little bit about um, oh, one more person. Talking a little bit about shoulder differential diagnosis today. Uh, what I think about in the shoulder is I kind of think about this continuum. So up at the top, again, we have this general differential diagnosis of pain patterns. That's just for your reference. MSK versus neuro versus non-MSK cancer. So you're always thinking about screening in that particular way. But um, in the shoulder in particular, and if you remember from the screening presentation that we did last week, left shoulder could be indicative of pain referral from the heart. Right shoulder could be indicative of pain referral, but probably from um, viscera, liver, or, or gallbladder. It could be heart-related. It could be MI-related, but less likely as left shoulder pain. Uh, you could have lung referral to the shoulder area. Um, specifically, lung cancer or a pancreas tumor can refer to the shoulder area. Um, but again, you're going to want to screen. You're going to want to ask for other symptoms of lung dysfunction or heart dysfunction if you suspect those specific pathologies. So those are kind of your non-MSK um, things that you're thinking about. It is also good to note that you can have pain referral from other musculoskeletal structures to the shoulders. So just like all of your body areas, you're always screening above and below. So you're screening cervical facets can refer to the shoulders. You're screening thoracic spine, of course. So I didn't add those here, but I think you're thinking about those things. But if we are thinking specifically about um, shoulder differential diagnosis, what's going on at the joint itself and the soft tissue surrounding it, I tend to think about shoulder dysfunction as these broad categories of somebody tending to have a little bit of a hypomobility, sort of lacking mobility at the shoulder, and what are those diagnoses and categories, versus hypermobility or too much motion at the shoulder, and what are those diagnoses. And just to give you a sense for why I bring that up, I think um, hypomobile disorders are things such as osteoarthritis, the joint space is narrowed, they don't have enough motion. Adhesive capsulitis, you have pathology in the joint capsule that restricts motion. A rotator cuff pathology or impingement pathology, oftentimes those are described on the same spectrum of dysfunction, tend to present with motion restrictions. So there tends to be a restriction in certain translatory motions of the glenohumeral giant, specifically posterior glide and inferior glide. In other words, the arthrokinematics tend to contribute to the pathology that we see in those particular individuals where as they elevate into maybe an abduction or a scaption plane, that superior roll of the humeral head and inferior glide of the humeral head doesn't necessarily take place the way we'd want it to. So maybe there's a superior roll, but there's a decreased inferior glide. So that mobility is restricted and that tends to cause dysfunction. So those are the main pathologies I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about this person lacks motion versus too much motion. I start to think about my instability diagnoses at the glenohumeral joint. And the far end of the spectrum is somebody who's dislocated or maybe had a subluxation at that joint where they've torn tissues or the joint has come, the two joint surfaces, the humeral head and the glenoid have been displaced. But you can also have um, pathologies of instability that are not that severe, but still present with looseness or still present with instability. For example, a slap tear where you have ligamentous disruption, a bankrupt lesion where again, you have labral involvement, but instead of being superior, like a slap tear, superior posterior, um, bankrupt lesion is going to be anterior inferior disruption of the labrum. You can also have multi-directional instability just due to a gross uh, um, laxity. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to make sure I don't miss any of these. Yeah, okay, we're getting there. So you also have multi-directional instability um, or unstable in all directions due to this person just being grossly lax or they've had a severe injury that compromises stability at that shoulder. So. Again, those are the two broad categories that I tend to think about, uh, and maybe that helps keep me honest as I'm 
looking for hallmark signs and symptoms in each of these diagnoses. Uh, coming back to that idea of, is this a diagnosis where I'm expecting to see too much motion, too little motion, and how does that affect their presentation? Okay, so starting off, first diagnosis, I wanna talk a little bit about a shoulder OA. Um, consistent with other forms of osteoarthritis, we're gonna see some really hallmark findings on the imaging, so decreased joint space, osteophytes or bone spurs, and then the sclerosis of the joints because those joints are having more contact. Um, there's some cartilage degeneration, and so they're seeing more force, so that it builds up that bone at the articular surface because they're contributing to the sclerosis that we see. Oftentimes, these individuals are going to describe some sort of crepitus, some sort of pain at night, a decrease in function, not necessarily specific in a pattern. For example, a contractile tissue injury pattern of pain with active contraction and passive stretch. Uh, it doesn't really happen with OA. It's a joint dysfunction. It's a joint disorder. Um, one thing that might show up, and this is just an imaging nuance, is a pattern of central baldness, and that's a cartilage wear pattern. And so the whole joint or uh, the central part of that joint is going to show cartilage wear or thinning. These individuals are going to have pain if you if you do a basically a scour test on them or a compression rotation test. Uh, similar to somebody with labral pathology, if you mash the two surfaces of that joint together, it's going to be painful. They're not going to like that. Um, adhesive capsulitis is going to be characterized by this capsular pattern of restriction. So again, this is a hypomobile, fits into that broad category of hypomobility. And they're going to be most restricted in external rotation. That's hallmark characteristic of this disorder is a loss of external rotation. They're also going to be limited most likely in at least two other planes of motion. Um, external rotation is most limited and then flexion and followed by, or sorry, external rotation abduction followed by flexion and internal rotation. Um, typically this person is going to exhibit pain. It depends a little bit about the stage of disease, but typically they're going to be stiff and painful by the time they come see you. Um, in fact, early in the disorder, they might not even know anything's going on. They might wait to seek help until they get into the painful stage where that synovitis is causing, that joint uh, capsule irritation is causing pain. Um, by that time, their motion is kind of frozen up a little bit. Um, they're likely going to have pain at night, especially when sleeping on that shoulder. They could guard the shoulder and hold it in a protective way. Um, some things that increase risk of this are going to be trauma, prolonged immobilization, where you have the chance for that capsule to really tighten up and fibrose. Um, females have this over males, uh, age category of 40 to 65-year-olds, and then some of these systemic conditions can contribute to, and I'm not necessarily sure we know why, it could be the pro-inflammatory nature of these conditions where you get a little bit more irritation at the capsule and that synovitis response leading to fibrosis, but diabetes, um, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, osteoporosis, excuse me, or thyroid dysfunction can predispose to adhesive capsulitis. Um, they're going to have reduced glides because that capsule has fibrosed or um, kind of locked down a little bit. And typically what we'll see is anterior inferior capsule is the most restricted. And if you think about an imaging technique that may show this, for example, an arthrogram will show significant tightening or decreased space of that inferior capsule. That's kind of hallmark for adhesive capsulitis. Okay, moving into the different, roughly the different category that I created where people are, or no, sorry, we're still in the moves too little place. So the pinchment, rotator cuff, this is kind of a, a continuum of dysfunction, but again, these particular disorders, I would say, have a characteristic pattern um, or a textbook pattern, at least in the literature that's described by reduced inferior gliding of that humeral head contributing to impinging of those superior structures or those structures within the subacromial space. So for the subacromial impingement, um, this is going to tend to happen with a repetitive microtrauma mechanism of injury where people are just overusing, 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 and maybe they have that decreased inferior glide, and so they're just 
pinching the structures in that subacromial space, primarily supraspinatus tendon, could be biceps long head, could be subacromial bursa, it could be a combination of those. Um, and kind of this middle age range is affected. These are individuals who may have a positive shrug sign, so similar to the rotator cuff pathology. If it's painful to raise their arm, they might have developed this compensatory pattern. They may have some weakness of the scapular muscles, so you may have some scapular dyskinesias, and that might be contributing to their dysfunction, or it might be a little bit of chicken in the egg. So because they're painful in that overhead elevation, they may have developed some of these dysfunctional movement patterns, but that's pretty common to see under evaluation. Um, clinical practice rule, you're going to want to use a cluster, a test cluster to diagnose these individuals. And so you're going to want to, um, the more positives that you find under these test clusters, the more likely these individuals are suffering from this. So there are a ton of impingement tests, but probably the top three that are going to be your go-tos are that painful arc. So somebody's going to complain of pain within the range of 60 to 100 degree, 120 degrees of elevation, whether that's a flexion plane, scapular, or abduction they could demonstrate a painful arc in any one of those overhead elevation um, motions, active range of motion. Positive Hawkins kennedy test as you compress or compromise that subacromial space, and then a positive uh, infraspinatus MMT, so resisted external rotation is going to be painful. Um, so ER lag, so external rotation, MMT, pain. Um, ER lag is going to be more consistent with rotator cuff tear. Sorry about that. Some other impingement tests are on there for your reference. Rotator cuff tear, primarily when you hear this, you're going to be thinking about uh, supraspinatus tear, although it could be any four of the rotator cuff muscles or tendons. Um, supraspinatus is kind of the default. And so if you hear about a patient who has rotator cuff surgery, usually what they mean is supraspinatus, although don't assume, you always wanna check. Um, that is the most common, and so if it isn't named, that's probably what's being referred to. Um, these individuals could have a very similar mechanism of injury. However, these individuals could also have an acute trauma contributing to that tear. Um, but their presentation is gonna be pretty similar as impingement. So they're gonna have pain with the overhead reaching activities, um, pain when they're using it, unless it's a full tear, in which case they could have a pattern of weakness or dysfunction, inability to move in that direction without pain. Uh, that is, as described in, in text, a kind of hallmark for a full tear is that it is painless. Uh, and that's something interesting to think about, even though the structure has been compromised because there aren't any intact fibers, you could have absence of pain. So that's one thing you might think about when you're being asked questions on your board exams is hallmark of a full tear could be um, loss of function, but no pain versus weak and painful is indicative usually of a partial tear of a tendon. Uh, demographic, middle age, um, imaging, you could see, you're gonna see a tear on that imaging. And the diagnosis of rotator cuff full tear, again, similar to impingement, you're gonna wanna use a, a cluster of tests, so multiple tests to try to corroborate or to try to establish an evidence base for why you think that tear is there. Um, they could have a shrug compensation, again, some scapular dysfunction, tender with insertions of those different rotator cuff muscles. Um, and then your three tests that are really going to comprise your cluster for a full tear are positive painful arc, like we talked about as above, a positive drop arm test, and that's the one that's different versus impingement, positive drop arm, inability to eccentrically control a an abduction motion so lowering from shoulder height and a positive er lag or positive infraspinatus um, mmt so resistant external rotation painful or weak or both some isolated testing for different rotator cuff muscles so these are things that you would want to know to test the specific muscles of the rotator cuff so supraspinatus uh, supraspinatus you could have the empty can drop arm uh, full can test would be biasing that. Hornblowers is a test that 
uh, is said to specifically test the teres minor muscle and tendon, um, infraspinatus MMT or ER lag test in, for infraspinatus. And then for subscap, um, you're thinking about the internal rotation function, uh, lift off or belly press to really test that subscap. Okay, so biceps tendon, tendonitis, and I'm gonna put just in parentheses here, tendinopathy, because it, again, with these tendinopathies, we're not quite sure it's an itis. This could be a chronic condition where you have kind of an acute on chronic dysfunction. It's been going on for a long time, but you have these repeated exacerbations or acute injuries, uh, acute flare-ups per se. And so we want to be careful. It could be a tendonitis if it's just started happening, but it could also be indicative of tendinopathy where you have a slightly different model of of tissue pathology. Um, these individuals are going to present very similar to the subacromial impingement individual most often. Again, because the long head of the biceps tendon is passing through that subacromial space on its pathway to attach to the superior glenoid tubercle. So, and also attached to the labrum. So, as that biceps long head moves through its course, uh, it's going to have the chance to become impinged in that same subacromial space, similarly to the supraspinatus tendon. Um, and you're gonna have pain that's gonna be anterior shoulder, lateral shoulder, it could refer a little bit, it could be a little bit nonspecific. And so sometimes it's hard to differentiate between biceps long head and supraspinatus as cause of pain. Some specific biceps tests that you might think about and that might help your cause to think about biceps pathology versus supraspinatus are your Jurgensen's test and your speeds test. Um, you can also think about the biceps role as an elbow flexor. However, with a proximal biceps tendonitis or tendinopathy, elbow flexion, resisted elbow flexion may or may not elicit pain just because of where you're applying the resistance um, and because of the function of that long head as a shoulder flexor as well. Um, so that's something to think about, but it might not be your be all end all if you don't have pain with elbow flexion. You can't necessarily rule out bicep tendinopathy. Um, bicep load two, again, that's a that's going to be a special test for biceps involvement, but also labral pathology. And keep an eye on that one because that is really key for labral pathology. Um, because of the tendons course through the bicipital groove in the humerus, you could have with certain biceps pathology, you could have subluxing of that tendon and that could contribute to the irritation on that tendon. If you're having sublux with certain movements that could rub across that bone surface and contribute to irritation. So if you do feel sublux um, because of either a lax transverse ligament or disruption in the transverse ligament that holds that bicep tendon in the groove. That can be something that you're looking for or could corroborate this diagnosis. Um, okay, so now let's move into our instability diagnoses or where we're having too much, too much movement. So the reason I like to talk about slap tear right away is because, uh, again, that bicep is attached to the labrum and with our slap tear pathology, so slap, superior labral, anterior to posterior tear, um, we tend to think that the grading of a slap tear lesion is partially based on whether there is involvement of the biceps. So I'll let you look up that grading scale on your own, but just remember that slap and biceps are integrally related. Um, and so oftentimes they're described together. Somebody with a slap tear could come in and present due to, could be an acute injury. Um, they could have a forced rotation or torque on that shoulder. Um, it could be an end range, abduction or external rotation. We also see uh, slap injuries as an overuse injury, especially in pitchers with what's been described as a heel back mechanism, where they have just an incredible amount of force within different phases of that pitching cycle. So the cocking cycle, but also the active deceleration. So the active eccentric moment of the biceps during 
Um, the follow through and shoulder extension is also a potential mechanism for injury on that biceps. Um, they're oftentimes going to describe feelings of instability or catching, locking, something that will think you, make you think uh, joint dysfunction or similar to um, like a pathology in the hip labrum where clicking, locking, catching, or in the knee with meniscus, that clicking, locking descriptor of symptoms is going to help clue you into some sort of intra-articular or within joint pathology, which is characteristic of the labrum. Uh, like we said, a labral lesion could also be a Bankert lesion, but a different part of the labrum may be involved. So Bankert anterior inferior labrum is what we're thinking about. And those Bankert lesions are commonly described with a mechanism of injury of a forceful event and or dislocation or subluxation where the humeral head um, kind of hits that um, labrum as it dislocates or subluxes. Bank heart lesions can also be described with their involvement or not of the bony attachment. So there's been something that's termed a bony bank heart, in which case that labrum avulses or pulls away a piece of the bone of that glenoid where it attaches as well. So that's something to think about. Um, and another acronym that is sometimes used for a banker lesion is the TUBS acronym. So a traumatic unilateral banker lesion necessitating surgery, necessitating treatment with surgery is what that stands for. So instability due to a banker lesion, TUBS instability. With slap tear, different than our rotator cuff and impingement categories, the best way to diagnose a slap tear is actually with a single test. The best sensitivity and specificity for slap diagnosis is not with a cluster of tests, but it's by utilizing a biceps load too. Doesn't mean these other tests don't have utility, but it just means that if you're looking for one test to hang your hat on, <laughs> this is it. And if this test is positive, that gives you pretty good justification for what your clinical findings are, what you're proposing as, as uh, injury for SLAP. Some other possible labral tests that you might perform are labral crank um, O'Brien's test could have some positive instability tests due to the stabilizing function of the labrum. Um, so sulcus sign apprehension, Job subluxation relocation. But I'll get to those in the shoulder dislocation section. Uh, so that's slap. Some pretty common pictures, um, traumatic MOI, falling on the shoulder, could have labral pathology catching yourself on something, having like a traction injury, that could cause a slap tear. Multidirectional instability, on the other hand, um, typically occurs without trauma. So this is an individual who's globally lax, who has ligamentous laxity, and because of that, maybe has multiple incidences of subluxation or dislocation, but less due to tra traumatic cause and more due to just overall laxity could be decreased tone or control, um, but more often they just have increased increased joint play. So that capsule is a little bit loose. And if it's significantly impacting function, what we may use is again an acronym. AMBRI is the acronym for this particular dysfunctional pattern that we see. So atraumatic, no trauma, atraumatic, multidirectional, bilateral, so it typically presents on both sides um, because it's more just inherent to their ligamentous um, structure. Treatment is with rehabilitation and sometimes an inferior capsular shift. So that's a surgery. So that's where we get the AMBRI, A-M-B-R-I. Atraumatic, M for multidirectional, bilateral, treat with R rehab, and sometimes I inferior capsular shift. And these individuals, instead of the tubs, 
torn loose person, trauma, this individual we describe as born loose. So they just are, they inherently have that increased laxity of the capsule and that's what's causing their dysfunction. So these, these people are, as predicted, going to have some positive tests when we test them on these instability measures. So it could be a posterior or a positive um, anterior posterior load and shift test. It could be a positive jerk test, which is more specific for posterior instability, sometimes called a posterior jerk test, where you're trying to actively sublux that joint or reproduce symptoms. It could be a positive apprehension test when you're placing them in. 90 degrees of abduction and moving them into a strong rotation. Could be a positive Job's subluxation and relocation test um, where you're testing kind of apprehension and symptoms in that provocative position. Um, okay, so shoulder dislocation. Again, uh, we're thinking too much motion. It's moving in a way it shouldn't. Usually due to acute trauma uh, where that Shoulder has been subluxed. It's most common at the glenohumeral joint in the anterior inferior direction. You can also think about in neurologic populations. Um, this could be common in a stroke population where they um, immediately lose muscle function and muscle stabilization at the glenohumeral joint, and that can cause sublux. So that's one thing you want to be careful of. Um, this person's typically going to guard their shoulder. They could come in kind of cradling the shoulder in that adduction internal rotation, kind of hugging it with the opposite arm, uh, positive instability tests, positive sulcus sign for inferior instability. I don't think I mentioned that. And then your x-ray is going to show the, the um, dislocation. So the loss of contact between humeral head and glenoid or loss of continuity. If it's a partial loss of continuity, it's sublux. Uh, or a full dislocation, you lose continuity, or congruity is a word I'm really, really should be using of those joint surfaces. Okay, a couple more here, and then we'll talk briefly about treatments. Um, but mostly treatments are there just for kind of your reference and notes. So, um, okay, sublux, let me clean that up really quick. Uh, all right, so bursitis, so cervical bursitis, Instead of a contractile lesion where you have a really specific pain pattern, pain with active contraction and passive stretch, with bursitis, you're going to have a more diffuse pain pattern, and it's not going to be necessarily in a pattern. You're just going to have kind of some diffuse pain. There's not really, there aren't really as clear triggers. There aren't really as clear relieving factors. They may not even have a, as good of a sense about onset, though it's typically going to be repetitive microtrauma. Um, not, not typically traumatic, um, excuse me, um, usually aggravated with compression, although different than other bursitis where maybe the bursa is more superficial, for example, greater trochanteric bursitis, where you're thinking about that bursa overlying the greater trochanter, you can palpate it, you can, uh, compress it and it's going to hurt. That subacromial bursa is deep in there. You're not really going to be able to palpate it. However, still, patients are going to complain about sleeping on that shoulder is painful um, because of the compression or the altered mechanical stress in that area. Usually that will still be painful. Um, imaging could be helpful in this instance to show some increased signal intensity at that bursa um, or increased edema at that bursa indicating an inflammatory response. Um, likely they're going to have some sort of positive impingement test due to the fact that an inflamed bursa um, is going to be probably a little bit swollen and edematous, have edema swollen. I was trying to be fancy there. That was goofy. Uh, so likely, as they go through that overhead elevation of their shoulder, they're still going to compress on that irritated structure. So that might throw you off a little bit. But you're still going to go through your CPRs of uh, impingement, maybe rotator cuff pathology if it's less clear. And it's going to be more of a global pain pattern where maybe all motions at end range are painful versus really isolating, being able to isolate a specific external rotation is painful or scaption is painful for a supraspinatus deficiency or 
potentially internal rotation is affected for subscap pathology with bursitis, it might just be that all resisted motions are painful. All overhead elevation is painful. It might not be in a painful arc pattern. It might just be at the end range or it might start immediately. It's gonna be much less clean and clear. And your palpation of the rigidic of tendons, muscles might not really elicit too much. Again, they either might all be kind of achy or painful, or you might not get much as you palpate because what's really affected is that person. All right. AC joint pathology, usually due to acute trauma to disrupt um, ligaments of that joint. And that's really, those are going to be your pain generators. You're going to be AC joint ligaments, um, costoclavicular, fromioclavicular. Um, you can kind of go through those to review pain generators. But what this patient is going to present with usually is um, aggravation with anything that stresses IDC joints. So um, bench press is one that's really going to stress, especially at end range of motion. Um, an end range extension of the glenohumeral joint, you're going to have AC joint stress. An overhead pressing motion, overhead reaching, especially at end range. Um, so end range pain is kind of a key hallmark sign um, for AC joint pathology that helps you differentiate from an impingement. So if somebody raises their arm up and they say, ow, ow, that hurts. You really want to ask them, well, where does it hurt? Does it hurt throughout the motion? Characteristic of painful arc, impingement, maybe rotator cuff pathology, or do they have pain at end range? And that's really indicative of AC joint pathology because if you think about the arthrokinematics of and the, the um, scapulohumeral rhythm or the interplay between glenohumeral motion and scapulothoracic motion, um, what we really see is that you're, even though you have this um, uh, glenohumeral or, uh, sorry, scapulohumeral rhythm where the glenohumeral joint over the course of an overhead elevation motion moves in a ratio of two thirds to one third of the scapula motion at the end range of that elevation, that's where you're really gonna get the maximum stress and the maximum motion at that EC joint. So I hope that made sense. I hope that wasn't too confusing. I kind of mixed up my words a little bit, but basically what I'm trying to get at is that if you're at the end range of flexion, if you're at the end range of abduction and you're pushing with overpressure, what you're really stressing at that point maximally is you're stressing that AC joint. You're not necessarily stressing the muscles that have actively taken you to that point. And that's why within the range of motion, using your muscles and tendons is more painful. But at the end of that motion, you're really stressing the joint if you're applying over pressure or if you're feeling pain. So hopefully that makes sense. Positive pain and range of motion and flexion, maybe flexion. So that would be characteristic, very characteristic of AC joint pathology. Hallmark. Um, your AC joint tests, your provocation, pain provocation tests are going to be positive for AC joint pathology. So cross body adduction, resisted extension, AC shear, O'Brien's. Um, in a significant AC separation or AC joint injury, uh, you could have a step down deformity. Um, where you have a significant tearing of the ligaments to stabilize that joint. Last but not least, thoracic outlet. Um, this could be vascular or neurogenic, but it's basically a compression or compromise of structures that exit that thoracic outlet space. So primarily brachial plexus and the arteries that accompany it, um, brachial artery. So you could have pain, paresthesias, numbness and tingling, you could have vascular symptoms, so cold, pallor, um, could be vague symptoms, could be unilateral or bilateral. Uh, weakness is going to be in a peripheral pattern, not in a nerve root pattern, so it's not affected at the nerve root or exit from the spinal cord. It's going to be affected at the thoracic outlet. It tells you where it's affected, so you're going to get more of a broad pattern. Um, this could be due to compromise via different structural uh, impairments, um, specifically muscle tightness at the pec minor scalenes. First rib hypomobility could help or not help, but 
contribute to compression of the structures as they pass between the clavicle and first rib. Cervical rib, which is going to be diagnosed via imaging and then positive thoracic outlet tests, which I named a few of those there. Um, treatment for shoulder. So Therax treatment. I just threw a blog post up about best shoulder and scapular exercises based on EMG. So they're really good couple of really good systematic reviews uh, that kind of delineate this. So if you're trying to think about which exercises are the best bang for my buck, I would encourage you to check that out. It's all based on the research data. Um, and then a couple of impairments that we see that are common and then just some little bit of brainstorm about treatment. Um, I'm sure you guys can come up with a lot of good treatments. So these are not the be all end all, but just to give you an idea of where to start. So thank you for that. I think I'm pretty close to running out of time. So I'm gonna stop the share and come back. If you guys have any quick questions, let me know. But that is shoulder differential.